Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. I'm really happy today. We have crossed 250 subscribers. Thanks everyone for the love and support that you are giving me. We are a small family right now, but we'll make sure we move together strong. We'll stick to the motto that we have learned once and never forget. So if you're new to the channel, please support me by subscribing to the channel and putting your comments on what you liked and what improvements we can make. Please hit the like button and let me know you care. So without taking any more time, let's see what we have for today's episode of Road to AWS. So first off, we will see what scalability means, what is high availability and what the differences we have. And we'll look into how load balancing works. We will do the hands-on for the load balancing as well. We will see what stickiness is and how to make your load balancer sticky. And we will then move on to the auto scaling groups. We'll see how they work and we will do a hands-on on ASGs as well. And make sure you watch uh, the video till the end because we will discuss about the important points and questions we need to answer for the AWS Certified Solutions Architect Associate Examination. That's a mouthful isn't it so we have so many things to uncover so if this moves a bit longer i'll split this into uh, multiple parts so that it is more consumable for you guys so let's jump right in okay so let's understand the simple concepts first and let's start off with scalability for better understanding let's plan a holiday trip to um, any place that you want let's go to goa this time so let's call my three stupid um, uh, oops my three best friends and let's go for the trip so my three friends are here. So what we need next, we need a vehicle. So we went out and rented out for four seater car. So no problem, isn't it? We have four people, four member car and four seater car. So it's all good, isn't it? In a few moments, what happens is the other three people that we have are friends, unwanted friends. They also want to tag along for the trip. And this makes everyone uncomfortable, isn't it? And we have uh, just got one car and now we have seven people, including me. And so either we can cancel the trip or we can tell them to get lost. And that would make everyone sad, isn't it? But we need to improvise. What can we do then? So what we can do is hire a bigger car to fit them all. Uh, that would be a good solution here, isn't it? Or what we can do is we can hire two cars with four seater capacity, that would also work, isn't it? The scenarios that you see here are basically we trying to improvise the current situation at hand and meeting the requirement. And from the bad situation that we had, where we were not able to cope up with the needs, we scaled. And that's how we visualize scaling. So in terms of cloud computing or general aspects of it, scaling is a property or attribute where our systems has the capability or ability to meet the requirement by changing its scale and size. So if you have a product and you wish to meet the growing demands, your system should be able to scale by increasing or growing or managing resources for the customer who are using it. And that's how we keep the performance up and keep the customers or the end users happy. In cloud terms, we have two types of scalabilities. One is horizontal and the other is vertical scalability. But what's the difference then? So let's take our examples again. So first off, when the demand increased, what we did is we got a bigger car. In technical terms, our application is getting larger traffic and it's not able to cope up. What we do is scale up by increasing the capacity of existing hardware or software or by adding resources. For example, adding processing power to the server to make it faster or increasing the RAM capacity or upgrading the volume to get a bigger storage. Let's suppose you have 2 GB RAM, increase it to 16 GB or if you have an i3 processor, increase it to i7, similar to that. That's how vertical scalability works. On the other hand, the second example, what we did is we hired another car and now we have two cars to meet the accommodation of seven people and we can go together. So in horizontal scalability, what you do is add multiple resources and align them to work together as a single logical unit. If you're working on a clustered environment, then it helps by adding multiple instances to your application environment to increase the capacity and meet the requirement. Let's go ahead and deep dive into both the aspects of scalability. First off, with vertical scalability. As we already discussed, vertical scalability is the property to increase the capacity of a machine or a system by adding processing power like increasing storage, CPU, memory and other resources. And as we are working with Amazon Web Service, 
we call it increasing the capacity of the instance. So you have your application and in the current situation, it's not doing that well. You have a good environment, but for more demand, it's failing to keep your customers happy. And in vertical scalability, what we did was increase the capacity of the storage and the processing power. And, and that is how we tried scaling the instances of our application. So vertical scalability is most commonly used in application and products of mid range, as well as small and mid sized companies. And one of the most important common examples of virtual scaling or vertical scaling is to buy expensive hardware and use it as a virtual machine hypervisor. Moving on to the AWS side of vertical scaling. In vertical scaling, you will hear the terms like scaling up and scaling down. Remember that when you increase the capacity, it means you are scaling up. And when you're decreasing the capacity, it means you're scaling down. In AWS also, scaling up refers to upgrading your hardware to meet the customer's needs. So what is the scope on which we can improve the current machine then? The first off is disk IO. Second is the CPU. Third is the memory or storage. And the other thing you might improve is your network IO. That is the bandwidth, for example, reducing latency. So if you are on AWS, we can scale up by upgrading our instances from uh, like using C4.large to C4.8x large, or we can change our uh, instances from T2.micro to T2.xlarge. This is most used for non-distributed systems like database, that is for like RDS. And however, Whenever an improved performance is targeted, the risk for downtimes with it is much higher than using horizontal scaling because this is a single point of failure. So make sure that you know what you're doing before using vertical scaling. So talking about horizontal scaling, it comes to our mind when we think of adding multiple systems to our environment, uh, which can help you share the load across the multiple machines or instances you have. So horizontal scaling can also be said as the provision of changing the number of nodes in a computing system without changing the size of any individual node. So as you can see here, we have increased the number of instances and we have tried balancing the load by distributing them across multiple systems. This is helpful for distributed applications like EC2. Moving on to the AWS side of this, we have already made this clear that in horizontal scaling, we add more instances and balance the load by adding load balancer to the environment. In horizontal scaling, we call it as scaling out. When we add additional resources or add additional instances to support the need and scale in when we decrease the load. So if you're working on a microservice based architecture, this seems to be the right step forward, isn't it? And you can leverage the same by using load balancers and auto scaling groups. We will discuss auto scaling groups in a short while. So keep watching. So let's suppose we have one instance and we are unable to meet the load or unable to support the load we have. We will add a bunch of other instances to meet the needs but that has to be calculated because these are very expensive to your company and you as a solution architect need to make sure you have a clear idea of the budget, what the budget is, and then make the decision. As we have covered both the topics of scalability, so what does it actually move towards then? What is the ultimate goal? The answer is performance. Yes, it is, but alongside performance, that is the way the application performs speed wise or response wise, the most important aspect is having a minimum downtime. It means if you go to Facebook and suddenly it appears to be not responding or it times out when browsing. So it is just not acceptable as a user, not even nine out of 10 times. There would be an outrage for this. So we always want to give our users the highest uptime and that's what we call high availability. So high availability simply means having the ability to make your applications more available to your customers. We aim for 100%, but mostly it is termed to have 99.9%. But how can we actually make our applications or product highly available over the cloud on AWS? The first thing that you need to remember is high availability is on the lines of horizontal scaling, but they are not exactly the same. So in AWS, in order to make our applications highly available, what we do is we host them across multiple regions. And within the region, we host them across multiple availability zones. I hope you have seen the episode of AWS IAM and regions that I had posted before to get a better understanding of AZs. So if you haven't already, then watch it after this. So if you see this example here, what we have is we have hosted our applications over multiple AZs. And even if there is a failure in any one of those availability zones, the application will not go down. 
the users will still be able to access the website or the app that we have. We can make use of these features by using an availability zone load balancer and auto scaling group. So remember, scaling is for increasing the capacity of the application hardware, whereas high availability is for making the application more available to the customers. Okay, so let's see this once again. When the load increased, we got a bigger system by upgrading it to a bigger hardware. But the point of failure remained the same. It was a single point of failure with vertical scaling or vertical scalability. And that's why we went for another solution which uh, where we had another instance to balance the load and help support the application to handle the load. And that's one way of saying that if the load increases, I'll add another machine and share the load between them. So like we hired another car to accommodate three other people. But what if the data center that you had your application in crashes or burns or goes down or in an earthquake like what happened in Avengers? That's why we hosted our application across multiple availability zones. So that even though one of the data center crashes or the users are not able to use it, can be still be redirected to other availability zones or data centers. We have replications of our availability zones and they are connected with low latency bandwidth optic fiber. So you can be sure that you will be having high availability. But for all this to happen and your users getting redirected and stuff and you being able to handle or balance load with all the instances that you have, you need something powerful to help create a configuration where we can tell AWS that, hey, look, AWS, I need my users to be directed to this instance when I want or, or I want my application to be more available so that when a failure happens, my users will still be able to use the application. So what can help us in this time? Yes, you got it right. AWS load balancers. So when you think of a load balancer and you break it into two parts, load and balancer, load is termed as the amount of traffic or usage being put forward to an entity that can be your application or the hardware that you might be using. It can be CPU load, network load, graphic processing load. And the balancer is basically something that can distribute this load or divide this load so that it will be able to sustain the pressure or load or traffic that the application might be incurring. Put together, AWS load balancers help you to automatically distribute incoming traffic or application traffic across multiple targets, which can be your AWS EC2 instances or containers or IPs or Lambda functions. And how they do is this by actually they help you redirect traffic to multiple servers or instances. They will forward the internet traffic, but they are basically servers that balance the load for your application. They can be used to handle the load for single availability zones or multi availability zone architectures as well. So if you see this example, uh, if you have your AZ and your instance, you set up the load balancer and you make sure that your traffic passes through that load balancer before reaching the instance. Having one instance doesn't really make sense, isn't it? So we have increased the traffic. We would want to scale the application and have our load balancer redirect traffic and balance it. So the incoming traffic and the outgoing traffic passes through the load balancer only and we need to make sure we don't allow access over the public IP. In the last episode, we discussed about why not to have an elastic IP or why not to use an elastic IP and thus moving forward with the load balancer is for this particular reason. So that we don't have to use the static IP which is quite not right way to design the application. And as a solutions architect, make sure you remember this. So let's check what are the different benefits that we get with the load balancer. The first thing, the load balancer helps balance or share the load across multiple instances. So if you have a load balancer set up, the traffic will be distributed across multiple instances and this improves the performance and increases fault tolerance and thus helps keep availability high. And the load balancers, when used alongside auto scaling groups, helps auto scale, that is scale in or scale out applications without manual intervention. So if there is an instance, that gets terminated for any reason, the ASG can help spin up a new one to ensure you have consistency. We will discuss ASGs in a short while, so stay tuned. With load balances, you have a single point of access because with the load balance, you get a DNS name attached to it that you can bind with the security group to use the same as for all the instances that you have. There is one URL or one DNS that you have for all your instances. 
that's dope isn't it so they can also be used to monitor application health and performance in real time using the cloud watch metrics so that can help you make specific decisions about your architecture as well another blessing in disguise type feature that we have is our load balancer stickiness that allows you to direct traffic based on the configuration you set to a particular instance we will look into this as well we will have a demo as well on this so don't worry so you need to remember the things that i want to share here so it balances the load so it helps balance the load gets you high availability helps with auto scaling it has a single point of dns contact stickiness to a single instance with hybrid you can have a load balancer which can help you manage on premise and cloud load on the same load balancer you can also have a user authentication ssl tls certificates which can make your application secure they can also be used to monitor applications health and performance so i hope this was clear so let's move forward then so why you should use ec2 load balancers first it's because they are aws managed it means aws will ensure they are up and running always they'll also take care of the periodic updates and maintain it for your comfort and the best part it gives the users the utmost features and configurability to ensure you can configure it as per your requirements the second one that we have is reduced cost so as all the underlying infrastructure is maintained by aws the operating cost is much less than what it would be if you tried setting up your own load balancer third but the most sought after feature is the service offerings load balancers can integrate with most of the services that we have for aws like ec2 elb rds that's for the database sns for the simple notification route 53 for the dns ami and as well as the auto scaling groups so now that you know why you should use aws load balancers let's see what are the types of load balancers aws provides the first one is network load balancer it is the new generation v2 load balancer or the v2 network load balancer which was introduced in 2017 prior to which people used the classic load balancer which was introduced in 2009 which we will look into shortly so network load balancer it operates on layer 4 of the osi reference model that is a transport layer as i hope everyone knows about it it is best suited for extreme performance application and it works over tcp udp and tls protocols like if you are setting user authentication or company's authentication this is the best thing that you can have it's super fast with ultra low latency the second one is the application load balancer it is the new generation v2 application load balancer which was introduced in 2017 it operates on layer 7 of the osi reference model that is the application layer so if it's the application layer you know that it should be best suited for the web applications operating on http and https traffic so mostly it is recommended for microservice or docker based applications Last but not the least, the classic load balancer. It was introduced in 2009. It was the classic basic level load balancer, which provided basic load balancing capabilities, which operated on connection and request level traffics. So mostly it was intended for application that were built over the EC2 classic network. So it's the old generation version one load balancer and it's deprecated. So please make sure you don't use it. And actually it's not recommended also. So this was a brief introduction of the type of load balancers we have for AWS. Don't worry, we will do a demo hands-on on all of this. Mostly I'll do it on application. So we'll have it on only one. So don't worry. So I don't want to just fly over the concepts here. This is just not about getting the certificates. It's also about you being conceptually correct. So please understand the pace that we are going right now. It'll, in the future, it will surely help you. So if everything is clear, let's move forward as with performance the health of our application instance is very important and this wonderful feature of health check can be done as well using the load balancers so let's see what health checks are so health checks in general help you determine the target instance is ready to accept incoming requests or not so it means the instance that you are trying to access or which is going to serve the traffic should be in the right state of operability so the load balancers use active and passive health checks to determine whether a target is available to handle requests and the good thing is by default each load balancer node routes requests only to the healthy nodes or the healthy targets in its availability zone remember this if you enable cross zone load balancing each node balancer node routes requests to the healthy targets in all enabled availability zones so as i said load balancers use active and passive health checks let's see what they actually mean so with active health checks the load balancer periodically sends a request to each targeted or registered targets to check its status. 
So each load balancer node checks the health of each target using the health check settings for the target group with which the target is registered. And after each health check is completed, the load balancer node closes the connection uh, that was established for that health check. And then the passive, even though it observes how the target responds to the connection, the best part about passive health check is that the passive health checks enable the load balancer to detect an unhealthy target before it is reported as unhealthy by the active health checks. You cannot disable, configure or monitor passive health checks. And one point to remember here is or one point to note is passive health checks are not supported for UDP traffic. So if you want to check the health, you need some way to check the health and get the status, isn't it? So for that, out of the various options that we had, one of the most used option is to check it using the URL routes or ports. So if you have a health slash health route, you send a request to it. If you get 200, it's fine. And you can say it's responding properly. And also you can use a specific port that you want to check and do that health check as we have shown in the example below. Hope that was clear enough. Let's move forward. So before moving forward, let's check on some of the terms that you might hear a lot in the upcoming topics. So it's better we clear that up then, isn't it? So the first thing that you want to understand is listeners. Basically, a listener is a rule that checks for the connection request using the protocols or port that you've configured. So the TCP, HTTP or TLS that we spoke about earlier, someone is listening to it. And that's how it determines how the load balancer routes traffic or routes request to the target in one or more target groups. So what is a target group then? A target group or target groups are either instances or IPs and each target group is used to route requests to one or more registered targets. And when we combine both of them, we will understand that when you create a listener rule, you specify a target group and internally the target group takes care of which traffic has to be sent to which targets that they have been configured with the target group. So now it's all set up, let's move on. So let's deep dive into the types of load balancers now, starting with the classic load balancers. So a classic load balancer distributes incoming traffic across multiple EC2 instances in multiple availability zones. And as we have already discussed about the single point DNS routing, the load balancer serves as a single point of contact for the clients. You can take advantage of the elasticity feature with upscaling and downscaling them automatically. The listener, the one that we discussed before, checks for the request and forwards it to the instance based on the protocol or port configured. You can as well configure health checks for monitoring purposes. So if we take a look at the example here, we can see that all the requests are being distributed properly and the best thing is that they are sent to only the healthy ones. Coming to the benefit, it has support for instances built over EC2 Classic Network, has support for TCP and SSL listeners, has support for sticky sessions using application generated cookies. So as cookies, we have an expiration time or session time, isn't it? So it can enable stickiness to it so that for that amount of time, the traffic can be directed or is directed to the same instance. So this is really important for the exam. So do remember about that. So next point as well, to ensure that our registered instances are able to handle the request load in each availability zone, it is important to keep approximately the same number of instances in each availability zone that is registered with the load balancer. So if you have 10 instances in one zone and the other one has two, it will make sure it shares 50-50. So the amount of traffic managed by 10 instances also will be the same as managed by two, which is very awful by design. So application load balancer is the new generation V2 load balancer, uh, which was introduced in 2017. It operates on layer seven of the OSI reference model. That is the application layer. So if it's the application layer, you know that it should be best suited for web applications operating on HTTP and HTTPS traffic, mostly recommended for microservice or Docker based application. Here as well, the load balancer serves as a single point of contact for clients and distributes incoming traffic across multiple targets, mostly EC2. You can take advantage of the elasticity feature as well here using the upscaling and the downscaling, which is done automatically as well. So the listener checks for the connection requests from the clients using the protocol and the port that you configure and forwards request to a target group and the target groups routes request to one or more registered targets such as an EC2 instance. So here you get to see the targets group that we discussed just before and which can target individual EC2s as well. So the health checks, you can perform health checks on all targets registered to the target group 
you can add one or more listeners to your load balancer depending on the configuration you have you can have load balancers enabled for multiple applications on the same machine uh, if you have multiple services you can use http routes to configure your load balancer your load balancing to point to that particular service so compared to the classic load balancers we don't need to create a classic load balancer for each of the configuration per application so which could be very expensive isn't it this was possible due to the target groups and we can use target groups in application load balancer as we can see in the example here we have load balancer and two application one is products and one is payments so one of the benefits of application load balancer is that we can use this to enable url path or host based routing so when any traffic comes with slash product it will be redirected to the products app and slash payment url will be redirected to or directed to the payments app you get support for routing based on the field of headers methods and query parameters and ip addresses as well you get support for routing requests to multiple apps on single ec2 instance uh, that we saw here right now support for redirecting requests from one url to another let's suppose you want to redirect http to https you can do that as well support for uh, returning a custom http response based on what kind of response you want from the particular url you can customize it like 200 300 or 404 suppose for the load balancer to authenticate users of your application as we have discussed it earlier it supports ssl and tls certificate it can provide security to your application as well support for monitoring the health of each service independently here not only for a particular instance you can as well check the health of a particular service with the configurations you set for the target group so understand that application load balancer works on layer 7 which is the application layer and if you know the osi reference model for networking you know the protocols that belongs to layer 7 are http and https so this type of load balancers will be configured to redirect http or https traffic and what else works on http and https the web applications so that's all for the application load balancers let's move on the network load balancers so a load balancer distributes incoming traffic across multiple ec2 instances in multiple availability zone that stands for all the load balancers so it is the new generation v2 network load balancer which was introduced in 2017 prior to which people use the classic load balancers so it operates on layer 4 of the osi reference model that is the transport layer so network load balancer is best suited for load balancing of transmission control protocol that is a tcp or the udp and the tls traffic where extreme performance is required same here as well load balancer serves as a single point of contact for the clients helps in elasticity that is upscaling and downscaling automatically but in network load balancer the listener checks for connection requests from the client using the protocol and port that you configured and forwards tcp not http request to the target group so you understand that it forwards tcp and not the http request to the target group and for the target groups it routes requests to one or more registered targets such as ec2 instances using the tcp protocol and the port number that you specify this is the same that we can see in the example as well where we are redirecting tcp traffic to the desired target groups the same as the application load balancer but instead of http we have tcp health checks can here also be performed on all targets registered to the target group and coming to the benefits of our classic load balance so ability to handle volatile workloads so what it means is network load balancers are best suited for performance oriented application needs where the workloads are unpredictable and this is because network load balancers are optimized for handling certain and volatile traffic so you can use a static or elastic ip to configure the load balancer and when you create an internet facing load balancer you can optionally associate one elastic ip address per subnet you get support for routing requests to multiple apps on single ec2 instance that was for both application and the network load balancer support for monitoring health of each service independently and the point to be considered here is network load balancers operate on net layer 4 transport layer and they redirect traffic on tcp udp tls protocols that's a summary about what the network load balancer is so let's move forward so let's check some of the important recap pointers for the exam that you need to remember first thing it is not advisable to use classic load balancers as they were deprecated they were used for classic ec2 where the instances were built over the ec2 classic network application load balancer helps direct traffic for http https web sockets and they operate on layer 7 that is the application layer and uh, the network load balancers help direct traffic for tcp and they operate on layer 4 that is the transport layer 
and health checks can be enabled using all the load balancers and can be used to monitor our instances or application services. Application load balancers are best suited for microservices and container or Docker based application and can route with path or hostname. That is can route with URL path or hostname. The load balancer will have its URL that is a static hostname. Do not resolve it. So instead of resolving and using the IP address, we should always use the load balancer DNS to access our instances. The next point is to scale load balancers rapidly, contact AWS to warm up your load balancer. While scaling load balancers, if you want to access them faster, you should contact AWS to warm up your load balancers. So AWS considers that if the traffic increases more than 50% in less than five minutes, then it means the traffic is sent to the load balancer at the rate that increases faster than the elastic load balancer can, can scale up to meet its requirement. In such cases, one needs to contact AWS to an operation called pre-warming, which in turn means configuring the load balancer to have the appropriate level of capacity based on expected traffic. And you need to inform AWS the expected request rate per second and the total size of typical request or response that you will be testing. ALBs can't see the client IP directly, NLBs can or the network load balancers can or 500 or 5xx are raised by the application 503 means the load balancer has no target registered or is at full capacity. I hope these points were clear. Let's move on.